Start the screencast to talk about the trends, chemical trends, across period three, and focusing specifically on period three. We're going to look at the changes in nature from ionic to covalent in the bonds that go from left to right across period three, specifically looking at the oxides and then the chlorides. We're going to look at the basic to the acidic nature of those oxides. They go increasingly acidic as you go left to right for those oxides across period three. You will be required to know the equations for the reactions of sodium oxide, magnesium oxide, tetraphosphorus decoxide, and sulfur trioxide with water. Then we'll move on to the chlorides, look at what their physical states are under standard conditions and what their electrical conductivity in the molten state are and talk about that in terms of their bonding and their structure. And again, we'll be looking at these oxides going from left to right across the uh, period three. We will also be looking at the chloride Cl2O7. And then we'll look at the chlorides bonding with those elements in period three. So looking at just the bonding of the oxides, so these are the oxygens being bonded to these elements in period three. If we look at the number of valence electrons that increases going left to right, so there are more electrons that can form bonds with oxygen. And if we look at the oxygen, um, each element, we get like one more oxygen atom kind of bonded with it. I guess it's one way to look at it. Here I have sodium oxide Na2O, then magnesium oxide, um, aluminum Al2O3, SiO2, kind of like I have four oxygens there, kind of. I think it's a weird way to look at it, but if it helps you, okay. okay and then so on until we get to the Cl2O7. So there is kind of a pattern, kind of. All right. The elements to the right of period three Okay, so we're talking about phosphorus, sulfur, and the chlorine. Can often form more than one oxide. So they exist in different oxidation states in these elements. Okay, oxidation state. If you remember way back when we were doing um, nomenclature, you know you have a like a copper one oxide you can also have a copper two oxide. And that Roman numeral tells you the oxidation state of that copper. Well, same thing can happen with phosphorus, sulfur, and the chlorine. How do you go about determining what these oxidation states are? Well, if you look at P4O6, oxygen you know is a negative two. I have six of them, so this total negative side is like a negative 12. Overall, this compound has to be neutral because there's no charge written on it, so this side has to be plus 12. Well, I have four phosphoruses, so each of those phosphorus has to be a plus 3. That's where this oxidation state comes from. Similarly looking, similarly looking at tetraphosphorus decoxide, each one is a negative two. I have 10 of them, so this is a negative 20 on the negative half, you can view it that way. This is then plus 20, four of these, this is my plus five oxidation state. Going off a little on a tangent, but you do need to know that Phosphorus and oxygen can bond to form P4O6 or P4O10. Oh, 
before we leave, you should also know that sulfur can be sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide. Chlorine can be Cl2O7 or Cl2O. It's helpful to know those different things and kind of memorization. Yeah, kind of memorization. All right, hopefully you remember that if I bond a metal and a nonmetal, I'm going to find I I'm going to form ionic compounds. Strong bonds, highly electrostatically attracted to each other, that plus ion and the negative ion. They are solids at room temperature. They have high molt melting points and boiling points. SiO2, if you remember from the bonding chapter last year, and you may want to go back and look this up, forms a giant covalent lattice. So the melting point and the boiling point are also very high. Remember silicone making four covalent bonds in a 3D direction, forming a very strong um, giant covalent lattice structure. Then the elements on the right forming covalent molecules. So remember covalent molecules when we're talking about melting and boiling points we're looking at intermolecular forces. Okay, these are going to be weaker than the ionic and weaker than the giant covalent lattice. So they're going to have lower melting points and boiling points. It's going to take less energy to break those molecules apart. Okay. So these typically exist as gases, liquids, or perhaps low melting solids. And again, we're talking about the oxides that are formed with the elements on the right. So your phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. Electrical conductivity, this is going to again follow those trends that we've been talking about for ionic compounds and then for covalent compounds. Ionic compounds, since they are charged particles, when I melt them they become mobile charged particles, so they will conduct electricity when they are molten. Aluminum oxide has both ionic and covalent characteristics. It's a poor conductor. Okay, but it does have an extremely high melting point. The oxides of the nonmetals, because these are covalent molecules or structures, do not conduct electricity. Okay, so as I go from left to right, my conductivity definitely decreases. Okay, let's talk about the oxides. Group 1 and 2 are basic. You remember mob. Metallic oxides are basic. And then Namoa. Non-metallic oxides form acidic. So again, sodium magnesium forming cations. The oxide ion can then bond with the hydroxide, that's not a hydroxide, hydronium ion, hydronium ion. So they act as bases dissolving in water. Okay. Same thing with um, magnesium oxide with hydrochloric. They will neutralize acids to produce salt and water. I also view, um, if we were to look at magnesium oxide reacting with water, we would see that it makes magnesium hydroxide uh, moderately soluble. Um, 
I view these as synthesis reactions because they they're two things coming together to form one. So I view them as a synthesis reaction and if these go together it's going to find, form those hydroxides. Hopefully that helps. Aluminum oxide is, is different and we'll talk a little bit more about its structure. Um, it can act as a base. Right. Hydrochloric being an acid reacting with aluminum oxide to form aluminum chloride and water, a salt and water. Okay, it can also act as a base, it's still a base acting with sulfuric to form aluminum sulfate and water. It can also act like an acid. Um, this is going to be a um, Lewis acid base reaction with some of the um, lone pairs being able to attract the sodium ion and the hydroxides. We'll have to take a look at those when we look at the complex ions and explain that a little bit better. Okay, the remaining form acidic solutions. If we look at silicon dioxide, it has little acid base uh, activity, but it does show weakly acidic properties by slowly dissolving in hot concentrated alkalis or basic solutions to form silicates. Looking more at the acidic oxides, phosphorus four, I'm geez, phosphorus five oxide, that's what the V means reacts to form a solution of phosphoric acid, a weak acid. Again, I view these as um, synthesis reactions. Put it together and make a formula where it all balances and it makes an acid that actually exists. So you do have to be somewhat familiar with the acids. Phosphoric acid, um, oh, well, phosphoric three acid, also known as phosphorus acid. Um, interesting. Um, again, synthesis, making a acid. Similarly, sulfur trioxide is going to make the sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid, sulfur dioxide makes sulfurous. The Cl207 making uh, perchloric, and the Cl2 making chlorous acid. Um, again, looking at a synthesis, making sure that it makes some acid that actually exists. Here's just a summary. This is a great table to have. Um, You can see the ratio of atoms here. Increasing that oxygen by one as I go over one, um, or as I move left to right in the period. Bonding from the metallic ionic, highly po polar covalent aluminum oxide. Polar covalent to polar covalent um, giant polar giant covalent compound is really what this should be. Um, acid base, basic, amphoteric, weakly acidic, 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 and then some other oxides that they can make. And let's fix this and say uh, giant covalent 